can you talk a little bit about how people cope with that in a healthy and, and unhealthy way? Yeah, sure. I, I want to go back because I think I didn't answer your question because <laughs> you asked, how does death anxiety affect people in midlife? Do you mind if I talk through that? Bit You're well? right. I was so fascinated that I didn't, that I lost track <laughs> of the entire focus of the podcast. Welcome to Gen X Mindscape, the podcast dedicated to exploring the complexities of midlife and the pursuit of a purposeful life. I'm your host, Kyle, here to accompany you on the journey. I'm really excited that you're here to listen to this conversation today. Even though this podcast has covered a wide range of midlife topics, I've been really amazed at how certain themes keep coming up and resonate. As we discuss this midlife journey, a lot of guests have been really insightful about the benefits of facing midlife head on, not shying away from the challenges, but instead embracing reality. And I've seen personally that when I confront these sometimes uncomfortable challenges with self-compassion and courage... I can really start to design a truly satisfying path based on purpose, meaning, and authenticity. So that mindset really sets the stage for today's topic, which is the first episode I've done in the area of existential psychology. I've found this to be a really, really interesting area recently. At its core, existential psychology challenges us to face some of the most profound and perhaps unsettling questions of the human experience. I know personally it's easy to avoid these questions or put off thinking about them, but I've discovered recently that if I sidestep these questions, I'm at risk of harboring what's called existential angst, which can feel like a sense of unease with life. Like, for example, if we haven't clarified our life's meaning or purpose, if that's unresolved, I know I can feel kind of adrift or unsatisfied with my life. And so today we're going to dive into one of these difficult topics, and that is death anxiety. I know this can sound like a daunting topic, but I'm encouraging you to stick with me on this. A really big reason for this is today's guest, Matteo Zaccala. He really takes on this topic with a lot of kindness and humor and compassion and just really remarkable insight. During the first part of our discussion, Matteo helps us understand death anxiety. Not as a dreaded part of our psyche, but more as a normal and sometimes beneficial part of our psychology. Then, he really gives some great insights into the intricate interplay of life, love, and our own mortality. And really, the ultimate takeaway is the importance of being purposeful with our days and celebrating life. For me, the conversation deepened my appreciation of my midlife journey and gives me hope for my future days. I just really feel fortunate that I was able to have this conversation with Matteo and that I can share it with you. So let's introduce our guests and get on with the show. Today's guest is Matteo Zaccala. He's a distinguished clinical psychologist in Sydney, Australia, with a PhD specializing in death anxiety, attachment theory, and evolutionary psychology, which, as you'll hear, is really an amazing combination. As a registered clinical psychologist, he has really made some significant contributions to the field through his clinical experience and his insightful publications on the topic of death anxiety. So, welcome to the show, Matteo. So glad you're here. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Could you start by giving our audience some insight into your background and how you became interested in death anxiety? Sure. So, I'm a clinical psychologist by trade all the way in Australia. My the research, though, so as part of my postgraduate training is I did a PhD as well. So I became interested in death anxiety many years ago. I started a PhD looking at the fear of death, the fear of mortality. I thought it was very interesting thinking about how as existential fears like that influence human psychology. But what I found is that over the course of my PhD, it became much broader and we started. There were, there were many unexpected twists and turns along the way. And as you mentioned, so it, we had to think about attachment theory, evolutionary theory. I thought that made it much more interesting as well. Nowadays, I'm largely a clinical psychologist by trade, so practicing psychotherapist. I work with people all across the lifespan, but largely work with families with very complex and severe mental health issues. Families that I think your podcast, your listeners would be interested to know, you know, families, when people think about therapists that work with families, they think we're working with children. Actually, mm. we're working mostly with people that are in midlife. We're working with mm. parents who are really the agents for change in, in families. And so I work with people all across the different lifespan. 
in my own work in Australia. So fascinating. Such great work. Could you start going a little bit more in depth about death anxiety and how that relates to our human experience, especially for those that are in midlife? Sure. So I think there's many different ways to look at death anxiety. I think on the one hand, death anxiety is what it says it is, the fear of death. Mm -hmm. And a healthy dose of death anxiety is really normal. It's really practical, actually. I think it does some good things for us. It means that we're not jumping off cliffs or jumping out of planes without parachutes <laughs> strapped to our back. Uh, but I, I think the more interesting perspective when to think about death anxiety is from an evolutionary perspective. So death anxiety isn't just normal for us as humans, but I believe at least that to some extent all animals have some level of death anxiety. I mean, this is what has driven natural mm -hmm. selection for thousands upon thousands upon millions of years, mm -hmm. is that you know, animals have to have some level of not wanting to die, of wanting to continue surviving, of wanting to avoid things that are a threat to their continued survival. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you think about it, I think that this drive to survive can be considered death anxiety if we were to put it in human terms, I guess. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about how does death anxiety affect humans, I think the first point is that if we aren't alone, that death anxiety affects all animals. What makes humans special, though, is the way that we express our death anxiety, the way that we relate to it, the way that we manifest it, the way that we control it, the way that we try to temper and to tame it, which I do think is quite different to the rest of the animal kingdom. So mm -hmm. humans, if you think about it, humans are terrorized by the prospect of death much more than other animals. It sounds weird because we are at the top of the animal kingdom in some ways, mm -hmm. but a single human alone is a very vulnerable animal. A single human is much more vulnerable than the vast majority of animals out in the animal kingdom. Uh, a single human alone can't fend for itself. We can't protect ourselves. We can barely hunt. We, we wouldn't be able to, you know, we'd barely be able to build shelters for ourselves, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that the particularly interesting point is the human child, especially. So if you think about the human child, the human child is the most vulnerable specimen across the entirety of the planet Earth. There is no specimen in planet Earth that is as vulnerable as a human child. I'm sure many of your listeners in their midlife would have had children themselves. When a human child comes out of the womb, it can't protect itself, it can't look after itself, it can't feed itself, it can't even move around. You know, evidence shows that it can barely see a couple of centimetres past its face. <laughs> <laughs> so humans and human children wow. are very vulnerable species. We we have to we have had to come up with some way of managing our survival, of managing our death anxiety that, that's different to other animals. And this is this is where I think where things get interesting because Yeah. You know, you ask what is death anxiety? I think the more interesting question is how do we manage our death anxiety? Death anxiety is normal. We all have it. How we manage our death anxiety as humans is the more interesting question. And, and how we manage our death anxiety is by relying on others. So as humans mm. throughout our ancestral history, we couldn't do things ourselves. So we formed tribes, we formed cooperative groups, families, social units, etc., And we looked after us, each other. And in particular, you mentioned that I have a PhD in attachment theory. The reason why my PhD is straight into attachment theory is that uh, you know, you've, we're faced with the theoretical conundrum of how does a human child face its own death anxiety? Because a human child, more so than any other animal in the animal kingdom, is faced with death every day. <laughs> more, you know, it's... <laughs> If it, anybody that's had a kid, I don't have kids, but I've heard from people that have kids. I work with lots of parents that say every day is a struggle just to keep this kid alive. If it was up to the kid, they'd be throwing themselves <laughs> off, off ledges. They'd be eating things they shouldn't be eating. The human child <laughs> manages its death anxiety by forming bonds with its parents. Mm. It's quite an ingenious tactic, actually, that it manages, manages this as existential threat by saying to its parents, obviously, you know, not saying, but if, you know, metaphorically saying to its parents, you do it for me. I can't survive myself. I need you to do it for me. And this is an incredible tactic. And in my opinion, this is one of, one of the most important reasons why humans sit at the top of the animal kingdom, because what this means is that we get to have children that are incredibly vulnerable, 
yeah. for decades and decades. You know, nowadays, kids don't move out of their parents' homes that 20 or 30 years old. <laughs> but what, what we get to do during that time is that we get to spend time growing. We get to spend time socializing, learning to such an extent that no other animal can afford to do that. Every other animal is so encumbered by the threat of death, by their own death anxiety, that they have to grow up at the age of five or six or seven, even the great mm. apes and stuff like that. Yeah. Whereas we get to have this beautiful t- period of growth when we're younger because we rely on our parents to manage our death anxiety and manage our death for us. And of course, I, I don't imagine there's many children listening to this podcast, but what's important <laughs> to note is that the this process where we rely on other people to support us, to help us survive, this process remains relevant throughout our entire lifespan. So that's what my research was looking at. That's what other research has shown, that wow. uh, these attachment processes, these attachment bonds that facilitate survival, that temper existential anxiety about dying, these psychological processes remain all the way until the time that we die, really. Wow. That is such a fascinating way to look at it. I've never heard it put that way, where we put attachment theory and evolutionary psychology and death and existential psychology together. That is incredibly interesting. I'm guessing in your work, you see a lot of coping strategies from that death anxiety. Can you talk a little bit about how people cope with that in a healthy and, and unhealthy way? Yeah, sure. I want to go back because I think I didn't answer your question because (laughs) you asked, (laughs) how does death anxiety affect people in midlife? Do you mind if I talk to that bit as well? You're right. I was so fascinated that I didn't, that I lost track (laughs) of the entire focus of the podcast. So please do talk about midlife and death anxiety. No, it's it's my fault. I just started on a rant, but I think that's a really important question as well because, you know, I was just talking about the importance of the attachment bond with parents, right? And an important part of midlife is a lot of people in midlife are parents. And so this is one way that death anxiety affects us in midlife is that we're not, it's not about tempering our own death anxiety. We're tempering the anxiety of the children that are relying on us as well. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. I think what's interesting, Kyle, is I'd, I'd be interested to hear, do you think people that are younger or people that are older have more death anxiety or more fearful of death? What do you think the answer is? Oh, that is a good question. Common wisdom would say that people that are older may have more because they're in that time where they're aging and it may be bringing about kind of those physical s- signals of death. And we think of teenagers as just kind of living in the moment. So that would be my conventional wisdom, but I'm <laughs> fearing that there might be a, something else I'm missing. That is conventional wisdom. And there's a reason that's conventional wisdom, because you think about other things that we're scared of. If you're scared of spiders and you're about to walk into a room with a spider, you're fearful of it. If you're scared of flying and you're sitting in the airplane seat and you're about to take off, you're scared. But for some reason, the research shows that people, the elderly people, so people that are on the verge of death, that have lived the longest, that are about to die, that are facing death, they're the least scared of death out of all of us. Ah, but actually, yes. there's a gradual trend downwards from about the age of 20 is when you are the most fearful of death. And it slowly goes down over time with one exception. And this is an interesting exception for your listeners that there's one exception. So this trend, it trends downwards from the age of 20. And so you're least fearful about death when you're in your old age. But for women in their midlife at around the exact age of about 50 or 51, there is a spike in death anxiety and their death anxiety Mm. spikes to the level that it was at when they were 20. Wow. And this is really interesting because from a conventional wisdom perspective, it's very hard to explain this. But if I can draw us back to a Darwinian perspective, something else happens for women at the age of 50. And what that is, is menopause. And menopause is a really interesting phenomenon in the natural sciences because it's only us and killer whales that have menopause. No other Mm. animals that have menopause. And so there has to have been a very unique and interesting reason for us to have this biological phenomenon that is so incredibly impactful, I guess. And the reason that has been hypothesized that I think is really interesting and links back to the idea of death anxiety is the idea that humans, much more so than other animals, like I talked about before, rely on being looked after and looking after others. So humans rely on grandparenting. 
And so the theory is that menopause comes around mm. because it's essentially an indicator to say, look, the time of your life when you should be having kids is over. You can't have kids anymore. Now start focusing on your grand on your grandkids. Now it's time wow. to start looking after your grandkids and also to help your kids look after their kids as well. And I think this tells us something about death anxiety. The fact that death anxiety goes up at the exact same age that menopause happens for women, and this doesn't happen in men. We don't see this phenomenon. I think what this tells us about death anxiety is that when we feel fearful of death, when we are anxious about death, this is telling us that there is a biological imperative or a human imperative, I should say, that we need to meet. Hmm. And so this makes sense if you if you broaden the scope out to what I said before, that our death anxiety is highest when we're young. We have tons of imperatives that we need to meet. We have entire lives ahead of ahead of us that we need to fulfill. And from a very biological perspective, we're meant to have kids and look after our kids and see them be raised and then can have grandkids. But from a human perspective, we have other stuff. We have you know, we have to establish ourselves. We have to establish ourselves in the social hierarchy. We have to figure out who we are. We have to contribute to society in some way, contribute to culture, etc. Yeah. So I think the, the the notion of death anxiety is very relevant to your listeners because, for the, especially for the women, your, your female listeners, uh, they're going to be experiencing, or the research says that they're probably going to be experiencing it all over again, just like they did when they were younger. Uh, although, mm. fortunately for them, it will start to go down again once they get a bit older. That, that is really interesting. So I think I'll come back to that and kind of build on that. So menopause and aging relate to death anxiety. Are there other factors that contribute to having a higher awareness of death anxiety? Yeah, so there's a number of different factors. So the stuff you would expect, I mean, the research is ongoing. This is a relatively new field. So having experiences with death, of course, you know, they find that if you have a couple of experience with, experiences with death, you're more fearful about death. But if you have lots and lots of experiences with death, for example, if you're a sky jumper and you've, you've jumped out of a plane 50 times, you become less fearful. Mm. I think mm -hmm. the one that's perhaps most interesting to me is in my own research, part of what I was looking at was the relationship between social connectedness and death anxiety. And what I found mm. is that if you feel socially isolated, if you have less, if you feel like your sense of connection to others is lower, you don't have many close connections in your life, then you're actually more fearful of death. And again, mm. that makes sense from the perspective we're talking about, that we manage, we temper our existential angst through our connections to others. And so if you don't feel connected, then you're going to be more fearful of death. And and that mm -hmm. makes sense. You know, if you look at Jane Goodall, of course, you know, incredible researcher. And what I thought really stuck out of uh, her, the original book that she wrote, The Chimpanzees of Gombe, where she follows the chimpanzees around Gombe in Africa, an incredible book. But what she points out in that book is that the chimpanzees that are ostracized from their tribes, so that are rejected for their tribe for whatever reason, they don't survive for very long. Even the ones mm. that are fully grown adult males, you know, give them a couple of weeks, they can't survive with their tribe. And I would say humans throughout our ancestral history have you know, undergone the same evolutionary processes, even to an even greater extent. You know, chimpanzees able to survive a couple of weeks, I reckon we'd go a couple of days and we'd be gone. Mm -hmm. Wow. This is such a fascinating way to look at this. Let's move on and talk about coping strategies. I'm sure there are healthy and unhealthy ways to cope with death anxiety. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. So I think some people that are very fearful of death, they can go a bit over the top. With it. <laughs> I think that's when what you're talking about when you talk about negative coping strategies. So I think we've all met someone that can be so fearful of dying that they're so over-controlled in their lives that they might as well not be living. It's ironic. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you can see there's various types of research that show that, for example, death anxiety is related to obsessive compulsive disorder, that people are so scared of dying that they're constantly checking the stove, they're constantly checking the locks on the doors, etc. They're so anxious that it completely takes over their lives. And of course, there's a great irony there that in their fear of death, they're not living. Yeah. 
And so, well, well then how, how should you cope with death? Well, firstly, it's not my decision to tell you everyone's different. <laughs> That's the problem with being a psychologist. It's very hard to give vague advice. I think, you know, the first piece of advice is if you're really grappling with this, that you probably should, you do your best to see a psychologist or a psychotherapist if you can. But I, if I had to give vague advice, what I want people to think about is, again, what does it mean? What is it, when we have these sensations, when we have these emotions, when we're grappling with existential angst, what are these feelings or emotions trying to tell us? And I think I alluded to this before that all of us are fearful of death to an extent, but if we are overly fearful of death, if, if it's something that's really on our minds, it's probably trying to tell us something. And so what might it be trying to tell us? Well, maybe we don't feel very connected to the people around us. Maybe we do feel socially isolated. And so maybe it's a sign that we should be trying to foster our human connections, our social connections. I think, you know, in some ways it's ironic because I talked about earlier that when we're kids, we had faced the, the terror of death much more so than when we are adults. But also we're much better of managing that when we're kids as well, that we turn to our parents, we turn to older adults. We had, we have these biological instincts that drive us towards adult, mm -hmm. the adults around us. It's but when we're fearful of anything. And I think in, in some ways we need to relearn those instincts when we're adults. I, I think in many ways society and culture in, in this day and age has driven us into social isolation. It's alienated us in so many different ways. And we need to be turning to each other rather than turning to consumerism, rather than turning to drugs, rather than turning to TV, rather than turning to all that rubbish that doesn't actually help. Mm -hmm. It seems to me, too, that it is a catalyst for clarifying what's important or what you want to do with your days. Do you see that as well in your clients and your research? Hey there, listeners. I wanted to take a moment to express my deep gratitude for listening and for your support. Today, I'm asking for a quick favor that won't cost you anything, but would be very valuable to me. And that is, leave me a review. Positive reviews will help other like-minded Gen Xers find the show and join our community. These reviews are also a big encouragement to me to continue to develop the show and create helpful episodes for you. So thanks for sending a review my way, and thanks for being a part of the Gen X Mindscape community. Absolutely. I think you've touched on a, on a great point that, again, what is death things? If, if we are overcome with the dread of our impending death, regardless of what age we're at, I think another thing that it might be trying to tell us is that up until this point, we, we don't feel like we've lived life according to the values and the meaning that we want to live life to. And so I think uh, when we experience this death anxiety, it's trying to drive us to live life in a more fulfilling way, yeah, live life according to our values. I think one of the best ways that you can try and cope with the idea that you're going to die, because I'm sorry to break it to you, but you are, we all are, is this idea that perhaps you want to leave something behind even mm -hmm. after you pass. And so... If you are encumbered with death anxiety, you need to think about, you know, one day biologically I'm going to die, but, you know, socially, how can I live on after my death? What can I leave behind for the generations after me? Whether that's passing on lessons, ideals, values to your children or your grandchildren, or whether it's making a more meaningful contribution to the society that's given so much to you. Mm -hmm. you know, all of human history is a history of humans giving to each other. Now, at the moment, we are allowed to make this podcast today because of thousands of years of humans working their butts off to try and make sure that the next generation has a better life than they do. And so I think it's both our duty, but also our great mm. honor to try and ensure that generations after us have a better life than we do. And I think that, you know, to bring it back to death anxiety, it, it it's very hard to be fearful of death when you feel like you've lived life to its fullest and that you're leaving behind something after you pass. Yeah, that is incredibly well said. And it's incre It's really impactful to me that the themes that keep coming up across these episodes are confronting reality, 
having self-compassion and intentionally changing into something meaningful. I'm thinking about how that might work in your work with families. I have kids that are adolescents and emerging adults. Mm. And as we discuss this, I think it's healthy to make that an open discussion when those fears come about so we can adapt and confront them in a psychologically healthy way. Can you talk a little bit about how midlifers might approach this across generations? I think it's so astute that you mentioned my own work working with families because I think a lot of therapy with families is just putting words to the unspoken, just giving people permission to talk about things that they haven't felt they have had permission to talk about. And really, in, in some ways, it's an incredibly difficult job being a therapist. Yeah. But in other ways, it's the easiest job in the world because you don't do any of the work yourself. You're just asking people to talk about things that have been on their minds for a long time. So if we think about death, I think, or going back to death, you know, death, of course, is an incredibly touchy subject for some people. I think it's very hard for some people to talk about death. Mm -hmm. um, but let's think about those generational differences that we talked about earlier. So children, not children, I should take that back. Children don't really understand the concept of death fully, but young adults, emerging adults, are the ones that are most fearful of death. They're the ones that find it hardest to speak about death. Mm-hmm. Their parents are probably somewhere in the middle. And then grandparents, I don't know what your experience has been like, but I think a lot of young adults are surprised by how openly and honestly their grandparents want to talk about death and want to mm -hmm. plan for their own death and want to plan their funeral and stuff like that. And it can be incredibly hard for kids to, or their children and grandchildren to talk to their grandparents about death. But I think if these intergenerational discussions are going to happen, we have to recognize that death means different things for different people. So, you know, people in midlife has to have to recognize that for their kids or for the younger generation, you know, death means missing out on a lot. Whereas being in midlife, death is missing out on a lot, sure, but you've also done a lot as well. And so it's easier for you to grapple with that. I think as well for the younger generations, they need to recognize that for the older generations, talking about death isn't, isn't what it is for them, for the younger people, that actually they want to talk about death. They want to bring light to this. They want to plan for it. They want to feel like they know what's going to happen and that people are going to feel okay when they pass as well. I hope I answered your question there. I'm not sure. <laughs> if I kind of you definitely it. did. That's what I was shooting for in terms of having this subject be open, normalized, and confronting the reality of it and using it in a positive way. But I've seen two older adults that are still wrestling with this. And I think that can be difficult. Yeah. I think another issue is that sometimes we think we're talking about death or we're thinking about death. We're not thinking about death or talking about death. We're talking about loss. And loss is different to death. And loss is incredibly difficult to think about sometimes or to process or to manage. But it's something else that needs to be talked about. We have to make sure that we're talking about the right thing. That Yes, sometimes we can talk about death, but often what's stopping us talking about death is the fear of loss, the fear of losing those that we love, the fear of being lost ourselves to those that we love as well. That makes perfect sense. That's a really helpful way to look at it. So thank you for that. I think it's important to talk about professional help. Uh, you've touched on that before. Yeah. But I love it if you would share with us some of those cues that we may need professional help, that others around us might need to seek professional help. Now, that's a great question because I think, like I mentioned before, you know, just because you're fearful of death doesn't mean that you need professional help. All of us are fearful of death to some extent, regardless of whether you think you are or not. We all are. We're all humans. If you weren't, you wouldn't be alive right now. <laughs> We all, we're all just animals driven by natural selection and evolution. We all are fearful of death to some extent. But if your fear of death gets in the way of you living, then of course that's when you need to seek help. So if it causes interference in your, in your everyday activities, if it stops you doing the things that you feel are important to you, or the things that you want to do, if it's causing a lot of distress, then you do need to consider professional help. And you also need to consider what type of professional help as well. So, yeah, I'm a psychologist, so I can spook my own profession. So I think <laughs> psychotherapy is great. I think everyone <laughs> should be in psychotherapy regardless of whether they're yeah. thinking about their own death or not. But, you know, you might be going to psychotherapy 
thinking that you need help with death anxiety, but you should be open to talking about other things as well because your therapist will help guide you through the process of what death actually means to you and what's underlying this fear, what's making it worse than perhaps, you know, most people might have. Mm -hmm. I just want to completely endorse that view too. I'm 1000% pro psychotherapy. Something I just shared with Mateo, but I haven't shared with uh, my audience is that I'm chipping away part-time at my clinical mental health licensure because I wholeheartedly believe in that. And it's been a big part of kind of the background of this podcast. So, so as we move towards the closing section of this interview, Mateo, what advice, what encouragement do you have for people as it relates to this topic, death anxiety? What are some key takeaways you would want us to have? I think the most important takeaway is that you're not alone. That, again, all of us are fearful of death to some extent. All of us don't want to think about it. All of us don't want to talk about it. Your dog and your cat don't want to think about it either. I don't know how they would think about it or what that looks like. They have weird dog and cat dreams about running away from people and falling off cliffs and stuff like that. But that's us being fearful of death. But when you're not in this alone. But what I would encourage people to think about, you know, as with any existential angst, but since we're talking about death today, is what is this emotion? What is this experience? What is this suffering trying to tell us? What is it trying to make us do? We are all driven by our emotions. Our emotions were designed by thousands of years of evolution to encourage us to do things that are good for us and, you know, to bring that into a more human complex domain you know things that are good for us aren't just eating surviving you know, reproducing blah 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 the things that are good for us are living fulfilling lives meaningful lives connected lives lives where you feel like you have some social agency over the society and culture around you where you feel like you can make some contribution to society and do something that you can leave behind as well mm -hmm. well said that's something I'll put on repeat and try to integrate into my life repeatedly. And so I appreciate that very much. Now, we this has been a fascinating conversation, and I'm sure people want to learn more. So are there resources that you could recommend for people that want to explore this topic more deeply? Yeah, so there's, there's I think there's some great resources on death and death anxiety. So there's a book that came out recently called Mortality. There's also a great psychotherapist named Irvin Yalom that writes these amazing case studies. And within those case studies, these existential themes come up quite a lot. And he's a brilliant writer. So you know, I have many of his books on my bookshelf. Again, I want to encourage people, though, to think about what death means to us as humans compared to you know, just this abstract concept of death, that what it means to us is loss, what it means is love, connection. This is how we manage our death anxiety. So don't just read about death, read about attachment theory. There's brilliant books and resources out there about attachment. There's a brilliant book called Attached, which is really good. And then finally, I, I mean, I don't want to sound too facetious, but I do think that you will learn much more about this, uh, about death, about loss, about love, what it means to love, what it means to be loved, what it means to fear dying, what it means to be human. You learn a lot more about this from the people around you than you, than you will through any book or self-help resource or any internet webinar or whatever. So you know, if you really want to learn about death things, like if you really want to talk about death, you want to really learn about love and talk about love, Call your mum, talk to your kids, visit your grandma, talk to your work colleagues about it. Why not? And of course, listen to, to the Gen X Mindscape podcast because uh, that's where you learn the most about life. <laughs> the rest of the episodes right. are great. <laughs> Sweatshirt, T-shirt, and everything else coming your way, Mateo. Big shipping cost down to Sydney there. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, this has been just a fascinating way to look at life and to grow and to think about really the important things of living fully. And so, Mateo, I can't thank you enough. No, thank you, Carl. It's been a great experience. I'm so happy you made it to the end of my conversation with Mateo today. I truly appreciate how he navigated these deep waters with both expertise and compassion. This conversation really stimulated meaningful reflection for me about living fully and embracing the present. I hope you've also found something valuable in this conversation. 
something that inspires you in your own midlife journey. Thank you so much for listening today. And until next time, keep exploring, stay curious, and stay true to yourself. Hey there, listeners. I just wanted to take a moment to express my heartfelt gratitude for listening to this podcast. Your support and feedback keep me motivated to continue growing and crafting episodes that are meaningful and helpful for you on your journey. That's why I'm inviting you to join our Gen X Mindscape community page on Facebook. It's a great space to share your feedback on the show, suggest future episode topics, or simply connect with fellow listeners. Also, don't hesitate to leave me a voice message over at genxmindscape.com by clicking on leave a voice message at the top of the page. Whether you choose to remain anonymous or provide your name and email, it's entirely up to you. Once again, thanks so much for listening. I'm definitely looking forward to hearing from you.